welcome everyone to tonight's SMEA uh, lecture. Tonight's lecture is our annual Ken Barakoff Memorial Lecture, where we tend to focus on historical aspects of engineering materials around the Sheffield area or other similar topics. We normally hold this event in conjunction with the Newcomen Society and also the South Yorkshire Industrial History Society. And I hope that if you remember those societies and you're joining us tonight, the, the event has been publicised through those uh, societies. We did try to communicate with them that this event was going ahead uh, tonight. So if you are a member of those societies, welcome. If you're a member of SMEA, welcome. If you're joining us as a guest, you're also most welcome. This was actually the last lecture we held in 2020 um, before the end of our season was cut short. And we're very glad that we could hold that event last year and again, uh, with an excellent topic for tonight's talk. So um, I will introduce tonight's speaker. So tonight's speaker is Keith Crawshaw. Keith is the chairman of the Holly Tool Collection, and that is the topic of his talk to us tonight. So welcome, Keith. Thank you very much for agreeing to give tonight's presentation. Very much looking forward to it. I will just spotlight you, and then we will ask you to share your screen and tonight's Ken Barakoff Memorial Lecture. Okay. I hope everybody can see that screen. Wait a minute. No, I'll try, might help you press share button. Mm -hmm. Is that okay, Andrew? Yes, we can see you, Keith, thank you. Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, as Andrew said, I'm, I'm Keith Crosher. I'm the current chair of the uh, uh, Ken Hawley Collection Trust, which is its proper uh, title, and we have responsibility for the Hawley Tool Collection, uh, which is currently housed down at Kellam Island. I mean, first of all, can I say I'm honoured to have been invited to give the Barraclough Memorial Lecture for 2021. Uh, David Eaton, who is one of my fellow Hawley trustees and heavily involved with Newcomen Society South Yorkshire, uh, suggested that I was probably the most appropriate person to address you on the subject uh, th this evening. Um, and in many ways, I was flattered by that. But, but also, um, I think I'm conscious that I've probably got an illustrious array of names from industrial and metallurgical uh, pedigree to follow in terms of previous talks that have been given. Nevertheless, I think I was drawn um, by the association of two names this evening. Uh, one, obviously, is Ken Hawley, and secondly was Ken Barraclough. Um, Ken Hawley never ceased to remind me that I was uh, not a Yorkshireman and from God's own county. My uh, place of birth was Worksop, just literally across the border. Um, however, when I came to live in Sheffield in 1972 um, as a new graduate um, in economic history from York, um, I was determined I wanted to learn more about the city's um, industrial history um, and I signed up very early on to a series of lectures by what was then the Sheffield Trades Historical Society uh, being held in the Applied Science Building um, at the University. Um, and it came as a, in no surprise that the two leading lights at that time uh, was the two Kens, uh, Ken Hawley and Ken Barraclough, and between them I think out of the series of six lectures I think at least four of them uh, were given by, by, the, by the two of them. Uh, Ken Orley I lost sight of for a while. Ken Barraclough I did come across um, a number of times um, because my first job was in the Science and Technology Library in the Central Library um, and Ken was one of our customers uh, from time to time. Uh, nevertheless, the Hawley Tool Collection did eventually re-enter my life at a somewhat later stage when I was the city's director of leisure services um, and responsible for museums. So this evening I want to give you a, a brief run through of the, the Hawley Tool Collection. Uh, first of all, I probably in a sense ought to, at least for those who aren't aware of the said gentleman, uh, this is Kenneth Wybert Hawley. Ken always kept the W a closely guarded secret for much of his life until the last few years. Um, and I knew Ken um, very closely, uh, at least for the last 10 years of his life, uh, when I became involved with the Hawley Tool Collection um, after I'd left my job at the City Council. Um, and Jack Jewett from Footprint Tools, who was then the chairman, eventually nobbled me to take over from him when he decided to retire. What I want to cover this evening um, is probably five areas one is just to briefly say what our vision is as far as the collection is concerned. 
I think describe the journey that we've made so far, which um, in many ways has been very rapid in terms of a collection that was held in private hands to ones at public. Um, probably to outline also what do we collect, what our current work plans are, and what, what we see what we see for the future. So first of all, can I lead us into well, what is our vision? Well, first of all, we're threefold. Uh, we want to be the tools' most comprehensive collection of tools and an authoritative source on tools and associated manufacture and trade materials. Secondly, in holding those to advance the education and knowledge of the public in the history of tools and tool making, particularly in Sheffield and its local environs. And thirdly, to provide a celebration of our tool heritage and our future tool making through partnerships, particularly in looking at our current tool industry within the city as well. Now, moving on to our journey so far, um, I perhaps start off with Ken uh, as really to say where he, what his origins were. I was born in 85, so I was born in 1927. And I was born on the Manor Estate in Sheffield. The Manor Estate currently and for many years has been notorious as a sink estate. And I suppose it was started to be built just after the First World War. And I arrived in 1927. And there were nice people on the estate and not so nice people. And um, I lived there for around five years. Then my parents decided to move. Mother and father, Walter Hawley and Isabel, his wife, lived at a road called Stonecliffe Road. I lived there together with my grandfather, my mother's father, Frederick Gould, who was a file cutter. And uh, as a young man, he'd gone to America with to see relations and uh, to see whether we ought to stay across there. And he didn't, which is why I suppose our generation is here now. Ken went on to start his collection. He generally used to say to us in 1955 was perhaps the important moment. And this picture shows Ken holding in his hand an iron brace dating from 1880, which he always referred to as the first item that he actually acquired. Uh, he acquired it whilst he was visiting an undertaker's workshop to demonstrate a wood planing machine for coffin making. And I think that very fact actually induced a great deal of, of humor from him uh, from time to time. But I think it's also indicative of the way and style of Ken's collecting uh, that he was cheeky at the time and asked um, in the shop, um, would you want that? And people handed it over to him. Uh, and that generally was the way that he acquired much of his collection. He did buy some pieces at a later stage, but genuinely uh, most of it was given to him through, through donation. The journey really started insofar as the collection was concerned in the, the public domain was in 1992, which is probably the first time I was properly introduced to Ken uh, when I attended the Cutting Edge exhibition, which was his first major exhibition of the Holy Collection, held in the old Ruskin Gallery and curated by Janet Barnes at the time, who worked for the Museum, City's Museums Department, who persuaded Ken after a long time to actually display some of his collection. And that was placed in a very successful show held, held at the um, Ruskin Gallery. Subsequent to that, uh, the collection uh, was found a home and moved to Mapping Street, where it was housed by the university. And it was given research support uh, for an initial period during that time. And Joan Unwin and Christine Ball in particular uh, worked with Ken on that initial work. At that time, certainly in 95, the collection wasn't owned by the Trust. Um, it wasn't formally uh, acquired by the Trust until 1998, uh, when we received considerable support from HLF and a number of other donors, which enabled to give us uh, the cash uh, to formally purchase the collection from Ken. Um, Ken, I think, if truth were known, gave it as a very substantial discount in terms of the value of the collection. Um, but he was keen that it should stay in Sheffield and I think was very concerned that had it gone out on the open market eventually um, it would have disappeared certainly almost certainly across the other side of the Atlantic. Um, when the collection was moved to Mapping Street 
initial listing and conservation by volunteers was started. But the challenge we had at Mapping Street was that there was limited public access and that the collection was also dispersed in a number of locations, uh, not least um, in two metal containers that were stored outside the Mapping Street uh, store, uh, as well as uh, places like Worthley Top Forge as well. During that time at Mapping Street in 2007, we had the first three year Heritage Lottery Fund project, which supported some oral recording. Because one of the challenges people perceived very early on was how actually we transferred the knowledge that Ken held, uh, particularly in his mind, in terms of the collection uh, to actually enrich our knowledge of what the collection would have for the future. Ken was also acutely conscious and um, he was always in a sense aware of his own mortality, even at that stage, in, even in the 1990s. Um, and effectively, I think we tried a number of strategies to try and actually encourage him to talk about the collection and the origins of much of the materials he collected. Uh, because in terms of printed documentation, documentation, a number of aspects were sadly, sadly missing. After that, in, sorry, in 2009, um, the decision was made by the Trust uh, to consolidate at the Callum Island Museum after they had made a successful bid uh, to develop the Holy One building. Uh, that took some persuading. Uh, my personal view is that the collection should always be down at Kellum in terms of enhancing the collections of the city's industrial heritage there. Uh, but there were, in a sense, personal issues, which I'm not necessarily going into, uh, which have prevented that. But Ken did eventually come round to the view along with the trust in 2009 and put their trust in John Hampshire, who was the director down at Kellum Island, uh, to develop um, Hawley One. And by 2010, Hawley One opened with three years of revenue support also for audience development work. I um, mean, in 2011, the first extension happened where we built um, a the somewhere for the metrology collection to be housed um, in the Sedgley Large Objects store. And also one of the Little Mester's shops in the Little Mester Street at Kellum was given all over to hold the barley saw uh, collection and also our own collection of saws um, in one of the shops that was there. And he's still there to this day. By 2011, we'd actually, in a sense, developed sufficiently that formal museum accreditation was achieved for the first time, uh, which hopefully then gave us some recognition in terms of the museum skills we, we were employing. This perhaps, this one slide does illustrate that journey because between 1955 and 94, um, Ken's picture points to a house on the right, which is where he lived uh, since 1939 until he died, uh, where a, a significant part of the collection was stored um, in garages, in out stores and in his roof. Um, but not all of it was there. And in 1995, we moved to the building on the top right, which is the, the Hawley collection was housed in what is now referred to as the Hawley building and still has that label onto it. However, clearly the public uh, ability to see the collection was very limited. Uh, much of the storage was very closely, densely packed, and there was also no access to the public room upstairs other than by a narrow staircase. So we started in a sense to look at the potential at Kellum and that first picture on the left, which I'm, sure, I'm sorry is, is fairly small um, on your screens, is the first impression uh, that we had of a building that we looked at at the end of Kellum Island, which was the old Wheatman and Smith Sawworks site, um, but had latterly been occupied, I think, until the early 1960s. And as you can see, was in certainly in my opinion at the time, very derelict. Uh, there was still some of this structural steel from what had been in there previously, but the roof had collapsed. And the day I looked at it with John Hampshire, uh, John displayed it as a site that was perhaps somewhere we could demolish and develop the new uh, gallery at the end of the um, building. And if you want to cite it in terms of your location on Callum, it was through the other side of the wall from where the River Don engine um, is currently located. Um, and we looked at that and we post the architect the problem of how, what sort of building could be developed on that site. And his first response was, well, not, don't knock it down. Um, for one, if we actually went for refurbishment, we could move into there without going through an extremely long planning process. Um, and a decision was made to try and recover as much of the building as possible. Uh, a new roof was put on part of the building, uh, but much of the roof timbers 
um, in a significant part of the building were actually quite secure. And indeed, one other element, which you can see on the very first picture, is some of the structural steelwork was uh, painted in yellow, uh, eventually became and performed its purpose of providing uh, the structure to build the mezzanine store that was built in the gallery um, uh, over the uh, area um, and allowed us, in a sense, some significant saving in, in steel purchase. Kenner was also anxious to try and incorporate a number of other features in the gallery development. In the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see a picture of a, a stone archway. Uh, that stone archway um, is the old archway to Robert Sorby's um, original factory um, on Rockingham Street, um, which had been um, dismantled uh, by the City Council um, and under a promise to Ken that it would retain for potential use at some later stage. Um, Ken eventually tracked it down and kept his eyes on it and we eventually located it at an architectural, um, best one to word is scrapyard in Barnsley, uh, where it was still carefully numbered in the pieces that had been dismantled. Eventually we did manage to, within the programme, to find sufficient resource to re-erect it on the double doors uh, that were part of the building we were going to occupy, um, and it did provide, in a sense, a feature at the end of the building. Uh, it's actually one pier, uh, short, one stone level short than it was in the original building because of the uh, site that we, we put it on. But the other pictures you can see just to the right of that one, uh, one is the gallery structure itself, which is, um, is that building uh, in that uh, second um, one down, uh, which was the original space. Um, and the, as you can see, the original yellow structure had become uh, grey uh, with some concrete reinforcing at the bases to provide with our mezzanine store. Uh, the mezzanine store, by the way, uh, was an invaluable insurance against the potential of flood because obviously uh, two or three years before we had opened in 2010, uh, Kellam Island had been overwhelmed uh, by flooding of the Don at the time. And then the far right picture is the picture of the, of the current gallery. As I say, the picture, just to blow up slightly, uh, that is the similar aspect uh, from the location within the building. The one on the left, uh, which is where there was the challenge, was it new build or was it refurbishment? That was the state of the building. And then we did go for refurbishment. And what the architect wanted to retain was a sort of industrial feel to the building uh, by retaining the original structure. After that, in 2012, we'd already discovered, as Ken said, as we, the day we moved into the building, it's not big enough. And that was a genuine retort, which he tended to have throughout of my conversations with him. And fortuitously, uh, the Riverdon mill owners uh, were looking at providing Kellum with some additional resource and half of the cash that they gave uh, was built, uh, was given to build the Hawley 2 conservation store, which provided with the further storage uh, facility at the back of our, of the site that we just had refurbished and also providing invaluable space uh, for our volunteers to work um, in an office upstairs. Um, and so that was opened in 2012 um, after um, uh, the donation from the River Don Mill owners um, and now in a sense forms the hub of activity for um, our work behind the scenes at Kellum. By 2013 we'd already achieved a second successful HRF build which was entitled Sheffield Craft that built the world and again that was another three years support for further work on trying to look at knowledge transfer uh, from Ken Hawley himself and also to extend our volunteer base. Uh, we had identified along with Ken six themes uh, that we were going to look at, uh, that we wanted to develop uh, further and where we hadn't actually got um, adequate documentation and out of those we did eventually manage to achieve five of them uh, because unfortunately um, only a year after we'd started the project uh, Ken Hawley uh, passed away. Um, he died suddenly in August and that wasn't that long after Christine Ball had also died um, two or three months earlier. So two of the stalwarts who'd actually initiated the collection had passed on. Nevertheless, the project did go on for another two years and we were able uh, to put together um, a series of booklets based on those themed areas and also increased our volunteers uh, to some 20 people uh, working on the collection. 
We'd also achieved in that time that for the first time, the collection was now all finally together at Kellum. I say down at Kellum, Ken's dream might have been to have it in one exact location in Kellum, uh, but it's in two or three locations within the Kellum site. Um, and we started work and completed the inventory check just to ensure that we were able to uh, understand what we had. Three or four years later, uh, we managed to have a third successful lottery bid, uh, which is our most recent one. It's one that's currently underway, which is called Name on the Knife Blade, which was to actually catalogue and also develop the association of, of local families uh, with the names in terms of, of what we have in our knife collection. So what do we collect? Um, sometimes actually listening to Kenny in my early days, I could argue he collected absolutely everything. Uh, all museums, and particularly with accreditation, are required to have an acquisitions policy. And we did develop quite clearly, in a sense, a focus on Sheffield. Um, that was intended to be the focus of the collection. And these areas that are listed on this slide, from light edge tools through to domestic items, were that representation of what Ken felt was the breadth of particular the Sheffield light trades, and where, in a sense, he'd identified particular craft skills uh, that were operating uh, within the city. And through his years in terms of association um, with those, the acquisition that Ken had 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 rapidly developed, certainly in the early 1980s. Um, and Ken, I think, was a familiar sight, uh, probably on following on from my archives people, as works closed in terms of collecting stuff uh, that people had made him aware of. One of the issues for museums very often is that word provenance, uh, which means uh, legal right to ownership. And could we actually track how we'd actually acquired it? Um, that's very difficult in many ways because um, Ken very often would receive a call from a, an outgoing works manager or foreman saying, Ken, if you don't get down here and choose what you want, it'll be on the back of a skip by the end of the next week um, and off to a scrapyard. And so Ken would take his trusty um, Volvo and load it up uh, with what he was allowed to take away from site. Um, much of it is that's yes finished product but I think as I'll come on to say later Ken was also interested in the tools that made the tools and how they were made so the various stages of manufacture are in a sense to him one of the very important aspects of the collection and also one of the things that in particular, I think we missed in the passing of Ken, and he would never necessarily accept that. We had an educator who was actually capable of speaking to a wide range of different audiences in terms of what the collection had. I've seen him handle both young children in terms of the knowledge of the collection through to a group of specialist tool collectors who he could talk quite intensely about, about the product and about, in a sense, the technical side of them but equally was quite capable of relating to um, any individual who came into the gallery, um, that in, in a sense, his knowledge and attune the way he actually spoke about the collection in a way that brought it to life to them. And one exhibit that I'm always very impressed with, and I've heard Ken uh, in his lifetime speak about it two or three times, is actually the process of forming a, a garden fork. Um, he'd actually, in a sense, managed to put together an exhibit which actually starts with a lump of metal and he shows how it was formed and how it was actually created to create the finished product. And he was capable of talking through this on a number of the uh, processes that we had and that actually what effectively brings the product to life. And in many ways that did lead in a sense to look at how in a sense what he uh, decided to collect. So whilst the collection does contain those finished products, um, as I've said before, it was also about the tools that made the tools. But equally important to Ken were those aspects about the people and the skills that we used to make them and how he could illustrate those. Um, and that led on, in a sense, to a very Catholic view about what we would collect. So we have, for example, a wide range of trade catalogues dating from certainly the mid 19th century uh, through to the present day. And this one perhaps just shows a, a contrast between two holdings uh, we have for Spear and Jackson's, an 1880 catalogue and one that was um, current until about a year or so ago in, in terms of their product. 
Perhaps the difference being, particularly in Spear and Jackson's case, is that the top one was made in Sheffield. Uh, the stuff made in the bottom one is no longer made in Sheffield, but Spear and Jackson still distribute it uh, from here. But th those trade catalogues, um, I think, are impressive, not least because of the range and diversity of the product, but also in terms of illustrating how, in a sense, product development and product marketing uh, was a key feature even in the 19th century. And that some of the actual drawings, particularly when photography obviously wasn't available in the early days, the wood engravings, of which again we've got some of the original engraving blocks um, in the collection, are stunningly impressive in terms of the range and detail uh, that we did in those. And we do have one of the sidelines, a demand uh, from collectors to actually reproduce some of our trade catalogues, which is in our pending file at the moment in the in the main because a number of them will take some work and also in conservation terms are quite fragile in terms of some of the copying uh, that would be required. So trade catalogues are a, 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 in a sense an important part. Another part that Ken discovered very early on in recording how and in what way the collection could be brought to life was the use of film and video material. Um, and on this slide what I want to show you is just one excerpt a couple of minutes from one of the films Ken did, as you'll see on the title there, is 1965. Um, he, with a couple of uh, friends, um, took a cine camera out and decided that they would want to record a number of the skills which Ken by even in the mid 60s, was also very aware was starting to disappear from the city. And he recorded on an eight millimeter film a number of those processes. So I will apologize that it's, if you're used to high definition uh, video these days, there's certainly not high definition in, in eight millimeter, but nevertheless an invaluable record um, of a process that was dying. Um, hand forged gimlets now uh, have disappeared from the repertoire that the city offers. Uh, but this film, I think, gives you a good illustration of the kind of thing Ken was seeking out at that time. This is about John Ridge, a gimlet forger who worked at the same trade for 75 years of his life. Ecclesfield is a northern suburb of Sheffield, but John Ridge was a, an Ecclesfielder, not a Sheffielder. And he worked next door to the Ball Inn in the Wallet end of Ecclesfield uh, in a tiny workshop, of which there must have been typical of hundreds of these things at one time and tragically the place was pulled down to build a garage in it. Here you see John at work forging gimlets. A gimlet's a, a tool for making small holes in wood, typically two to six millimeters diameter and people would use them for making holes for screws and putting uh, small holes through pieces of wood for whatever reason. Nowadays, of course, most people buy a quite an expensive electric bill to do the same job. Here he is bossing the tool, the gimlet, which is making it from a round section into a half round section at the end. And now he's twisting it and he straightens that twist with his hammer. So the whole thing becomes truly straight and then he puts a nose on the tool which eventually will have a screw point filed on it. Eventually the gimlet has a, a head or a Now, Ken, during his time, and I'll refer later, I'm going to just talk about what we've done in terms of further digitisation, had in his terms a cast list of what he almost referred to as the Sheffield Stars, uh, not the newspaper, but uh, people who he felt, in a sense, displayed the craft skills of people in Sheffield. And this is his cast list of individuals. You can probably tell by the name, the vintage of most of the people, a fair number of those names, while some have resurrected in general usage, 
um, are in a sense uh, names of the past. But represented in here were people who in the mid 1960s and early 70s uh, were by and large still around. But as you can tell, even from the film uh, that we've just watched uh, of John Ridge, that most of those individuals were in their 70s and in cases of some of them in terms of the filming uh, were well into their 80s. Uh, then if you go through the names now, they're only one immediately that I recognise as being uh, 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 around, but uh, certainly one we've just lost recently is Stan Shaw. And Stan was one of the people who Ken did uh, some filming in his very early days, even before Stan moved down to uh, Callum Island. So in looking both at film, we also have a collection of photographs. Again, uh, vast and varied. It ranges from uh, stuff of our own collection, such as the knife collection, which we've got, catalogues where we might not have them, but we've either begged, borrowed or stolen them and have been allowed to take a photographic record of them. Photographs that Ken took in terms of some of the workshops that he visited and, and also photographs that we've acquired uh, that have been given to us. Um, and they, again, form an invaluable resource and an adjunct to the city's resources uh, that are available through the picture collection, uh, collection. Equally, we've got a wide range of printed books and magazines as part of our resources. Um, again, they range uh, from individual histories that sometimes have not been published, uh, but Ken has acquired from friends and contacts, uh, through to stuff uh, where, in a sense, we've contributed as a collection to their publication. And so they do provo provide a very valuable uh, research resource for people looking at the history and, and uh, of tools within this and tool making within the city. Uh, some, such as the one on the bottom right hand corner, which is too for, for small for you to see here, is the British Saws and Sawmakers book uh, written by Simon Barley, who's been one of our volunteers for many years. Uh, and again, perhaps illustrates the kind of volunteers Hall is attracted. They've not necessarily been people whose careers started off in industry. Uh, Simon was a GP um, who developed uh, a close interest in sores and perhaps arguably became uh, the leading uh, history of sore expert in the UK, uh, which led to write, um, led to him publishing um, a considerable um, treatise in terms of the history of sore making. In addition, the collection has also got with it design drawings and artwork and some archival material. Uh, the collection has a range of drawings uh, from Mapping and Webs and some, uh, some smaller ones from Elkington's. But the Mapping and Web collection that we've got is based upon uh, Ken's connections uh, with the chief designer at, at uh, Mappings and also um, other people who, as the companies withdrew from Sheffield and closed, they were fearful that things like paper records were just being dumped um, and thrown away. And Ken, through his powers of persuasion, managed to get them passed on to the collection. A slight irony in Mappin's case um, is that three or four years ago, we were approached by Mappin and Webbs um, in London, um, whatever the current guys under the ownership of Mappin and Webbs, um, to ask if we if we would be willing to transfer our paper records to them. Uh, the challenge being, of course, is that they were trying to develop a portfolio of materials based on, cap, um, on Mappin's historical uh, works, which the company who currently, in a sense, in its current being, um, was not, in a sense, uh, related directly to the Mappin and Web that was in Sheffield. It has a pedigree in ownership that's passed through a number of vehicles, and not least um, is a group, I think, of venture capitalists who owned uh, Mappin and then passed it on uh, to some of them, the Goldsmiths Group. Um, and they were interested and after some time um, I think were at least agreed that they would have a photographic record taken of them. Uh, we're still waiting for the final go ahead on that but I think it was interesting that we had two people from Mapping and Webs come to Sheffield who didn't even realise the connection of Mapping uh, to the city and it was only when I uh, did a brief tour from the railway station to Callum Island via uh, Mapping Street and the Mapping Art Gallery that they recognised that the word Mapping and the association uh, was directly with the city. Ken also acquired some papers from Light Trades House um, which again were in danger of being uh, disposed of um, as, as people, in a sense, rationalise their accommodation. 
it has made, in a sense, management of the collection um, a challenge um, because of the diversity of what we have. It's also been a challenge because uh, the collection was personal um, as well. Um, one of the invaluable elements within the collection, which to this day we still keep coming across, are Ken's penciled notes and drawings, uh, which will suddenly come out of a box that you open, uh, referring to the contents. And this in many ways has been invaluable, particularly in recording and the knowledge transfer challenge that we had. And the ones illustrated on this slide is but one example um, about the making of a file and what files were used for, which Ken had written um, some uh, description um, as part of a piece of work he was doing, uh, of which we also have a film of Ken hand um, making a, a, a file. Um, and one of the important uh, records we have is Ken's notes to that film. So there was both the personal aspect in his notes and comments and how actually we can catalogue those and make them more widely available. But also, as I've said earlier, about how we record the collection with its different forms and media. Uh, we have during the time now moved on to having a, a, a database with developed. We use a system called MOSE, which is a, a standard museums one. Um, but there is a challenge in terms of how much we can re record and then the detail. And one of our clear significant challenges at the moment is whilst we have an inventory list based there, it's actually quite sketchy on some elements of the collection. Um, and we are hopeful uh, that we will make progress in terms of trying to put more detail behind some of the items that we have in the collection. And but in doing that, we are dependent on the knowledge and expertise that we're able to attract. As I said, people like Sam and ba Bali have come to us who've got a particular expertise and knowledge of sores. We have other people who have knowledge of planes. Uh, David Eaton, I've already mentioned, has an interest in metrology, and so David looks after that aspect of the collection. But there are gaps in that knowledge, and we do have gaps in terms of our knowledge, and we always welcome any volunteer who could actually add to our knowledge of, of the collection. Equally, um, we've had the challenge continuously about the storage and size of what we hold. Um, and it is equally a challenge in terms of how we present it. Um, it's not the easiest thing, for example, to put a display of, on, on public view of uh, cutting edges of, of things like saws and knives. And so we have to take in such great care in how we make those available and how we can present them. Not least also is the size of some of the materials and the difficulties in storing it. Um, one of the bits that we haven't really got on display yet is Ken's collection of anvils. Um, we must have somewhere between 16 and 25 um, anvils of all shapes and sizes that Ken acquired from various um, uh, forges over his time. Uh, the not least, in a sense, is the weight of moving those around and finding somewhere adequate to store them. And that collection is currently stored in the large objects store um, at, at Kellum. I've already referred to factors in interpretation of public presentation, particularly when we moved down to Kellum Island, was one of the areas that, in a sense, we had to give most thought to, because part of the condition originally of HLF giving us a sizable contribution to the purchase of a collection was making it publicly available. And I think for the first time, and Ken was quite proud of this in 2010, we had somewhere that we could actually display the collection and the range of what it held. And Kellum gave us that prospect for the first time. However, collection hasn't st stopped since Ken died. Um, number of the uh, opportunities we've had of further acquisitions have not been small. Um, illustrated on this one is one of the prime ones we've had in the past two years is the Dennis Smith collection, who was an acquaintance of Ken, um, who again died two or three years ago. Uh, when I was suddenly uh, tipped off by one of Dennis's friends that the council had acquired Dennis's collection of, of knives as part, in a sense, of looking towards retrieving uh, Dennis's uh, funeral costs, which the council had had to find uh, because Dennis had died in test state. He'd occupied a, a council house um, somewhere in Parson Cross area um, and Dennis 
um, as how the council had, in a sense, effectively taken the assets that were remaining in there. There were no, at that time, uh, clarity as to whether there were any living relatives. And the council had, in a sense, arranged uh, Dennis's funeral, but had discovered uh, that there was a significant knife collection. Um, we made contact with the council's executors department and the first I saw of the collection was going down to the uh, council offices at Moor Foot uh, to be faced by what here are only six of about ten tables worth of knives laid out for us to say well were we still interested in them and any close examination of what's on those tables uh, the answer has to be yes. Uh, Dennis's particular interest had been what he termed in rural cutlery of some of the smaller cutlers around the city and there were examples of cutlery ranging from uh, certainly the early 18th century uh, through to the late 19th century represented in Dennis's collection. Many of the items uh, representing gaps that we knew we had in our collection, not just table knives uh, but also spring knives as well and, and pen knives. Eventually we were in a sense able to negotiate um, with what were found to be half a dozen of Dennis's distant relatives uh, that they agreed that the collection should be donated to the Hawley collection and therefore was acquired. And again it's a collection that still acquires some more detailed cataloguing. Dennis a bit like Ken uh, produced a, the, the odd notes in terms of some of his collection and some extensive papers which we're able to retrieve uh, but it is one of our intentions uh, that a fair proportion of that will uh, be available for public display before long. Side by side of that in recent years uh, we've also just acquired the Toolbank collection. Um, Toolbank um, are a firm um, distributing uh, it's a tool wholesaler based in Dartford in Kent and again we were tipped off uh, the, the, current, the then chairman of Toolbank was about to retire and the company were perhaps giving thought to how and in what way uh, they could seek to look at the long-term care of the collection. Anyway, we made contact with them and uh, we received uh, just over a year ago uh, some 90 plastic crates um, containing 2,000 or so objects from the Toolbank collection of which uh, they had had a printed uh, catalogue which again had been a personal collection developed by the chairman and had been on display in a store within uh, their warehouse um, of, of, of tools um, that many of which again are not represented necessarily in the Hawley collection. Uh, Toolbank in particular uh, is fairly strong on tools probably made in London rather than in Sheffield although there are some Sheffield examples there and some um, items uh, which do duplicate what we have. But again we've been at the moment we haven't been given the collection it's been placed on long-term loan with us the expectation, however, is that Toolblank, I think, have indicated uh, that they will look to transferring the ownership of the collection to our long term care um, in the future. And again, in relation to that, uh, we've been able to put a small display of some of those items on in the collection. Equally, our collection does contain other loans. Uh, perhaps the most famous one um, on the picture on the left is the year knife, um, which is perhaps our uh, in a sense most valuable object on display in, in the gallery um, and also our collection of giant tools which might not be the most valuable but in terms of interest particularly for children uh, do attract uh, some of the most significant interest. Again coming to find two quite distinct groups. Uh, the year knife um, was initiated by um, in Sheffield in 1821 1822. Um, I'm sorry to be propagate on the date, there's some doubt whether it was one or the other, but it is its 200th anniversary this coming year and was acquired by Stanley Tools uh, when the company that originally made it uh, went into uh, receivership um, in the late 1970s. Um, it was bought, uh, surprisingly enough, for the primacy sum of two and a half thousand pounds by Stanley. Um, uh, the city uh, museum service at the time declared it couldn't afford it. Um, its insurance value I'll not disclose in public uh, but it's considerably more than that. But Ken's work with Stanley in ensuring that it stayed within the city was part in a sense of the work he did behind the scenes in persuading 
uh, people to look after the city's heritage and in a sense the displays of craft skills. The knife was acquired by Stanley, it was then refurbished by um, Stan Shaw at a price that was more than the purchase price and Stan also installed the final blade um, in the knife um, for the year 2000 which um, is, a, is uh, stamped with Stanley's name on it um, and that currently sits in the, in, in, in the gallery. The other tools are not strictly tools made in Sheffield. Um, they were actually given to us by somebody called David Pond to place on deposit. Uh, David's grandfather had had them made as display items for his business in Birmingham. Uh, David came on the phone to me uh, one day disconsolate that Birmingham museums hadn't really expressed any real interest in them and David was looking for a home and um, we said yes we were willing to give them a home and he brought them to Sheffield and we said we would would display them and David uh, was so pleased with that uh, that he then said we could have them on long-term loan. Again um, unfortunately David has now passed away and he whilst we in a sense have to still have the discussions with his family I think David's long-term intention is, is that we should retain and keep them. So the collection is both a mixture of stuff we've acquired from Ken, of new acquisitions that, that we've made and perhaps the most significant trust purchase that we've made, um, which I haven't got an illustration on the slides this evening, uh, was a saw uh, that we acquired um, three or four years ago, um, which had been put on sale in a, uh, by a dealer in uh, Vienna, uh, which was a wedding present that had been given by a Sheffield saw manufacturer um, to Queen Victoria's eldest daughter and the Crown Prince of Prussia, who later became uh, the Kaiser, not the wartime Kaiser, but his father. Um, and it had gone into uh, their, uh, in a sense, their personal uh, possession and had resurfaced via a Swiss Italian collector who had said he'd bought it in a dealer in Paris uh, sometime in the 1950s. Now provenance there was an issue because there was a gap between when the soil left Sheffield in the, in the 1860s and had appeared on the French market in about 1954 as to how that had come. We suspect it might have been uh, the result of some war looting um, and it turned up in, uh, in Paris, um, perhaps not by an American GI on his way home because uh, the Prussian royal family uh, did have um, and did feature as part of a case where there had been six um, American officers prosecuted for looting uh, from the collection where this perhaps was in a sense cited. However, out of surety, we did track down uh, the families um, who, in a sense, who perhaps might have been the rightful ownership, and they assented and said that they were quite happy uh, for us to acquire it. Um, it's a wonderful little back saw, perhaps in size terms is would be regarded as a, a, as a lady's saw rather than a man's saw, but it has an intricate ivory handle um, and some um, clear engraving um, on the saw and is, is one of the things that we have on display in the gallery. Smaller we are, um, with, through our volunteers, we still do manage to undertake some research into aspects of the collection. And we have had some publications um, have come out of that. Perhaps the most notable one which illustrates the collection as a whole is the book on the left is the Ken Hawley experience, which Ken collaborated with Derek Bateson uh, to produce when the gallery opened, uh, which does illustrate the range and breadth of what the collection has within it. It can only, it only illustrates about 200 items, uh, but nevertheless does give some feeling of the depth and range. Some smaller ones, which with the Tool Trades History Society, Ken collaborated, come back to that favorite subject is Gimlet Patterns and Manufacture. Um, again, is a small booklet, uh, which does illustrate more clearly the history behind uh, Gimlet making. I have to say, it's not the last of the Red Hot Sellers and anybody interested in the history of Gimlet's, um, we're more than happy to uh, sell you some of our remaining stock of that. Simon Barley have not only produced the large scale uh, research guide, he's also produced from that a history and collector's guide to British Saws, which is a more populous version, which you see illustrated there. And similarly, the contents page I've extracted from one of the six booklets we had, 
uh, that tried in a sense to capture uh, some of the information about a particular aspect of our collection. And this one is on file making. Um, if David Eaton were, were uh, to address you as interested in, in file making as well as metrology, um, does point to the fact that file making was one of the biggest employers in the city, certainly in the early part of the 20th century. And finally, some informal notes where we've tried to pull together some of Ken's um, brief notes that he'd, he'd stuck in about, in a sense, in this instance, is one illustrating uh, some information about Sheffield razors uh, that he'd noted down uh, within the box that uh, we'd opened. All really this material adds up to that we've got an integrated store of information on Sheffield's metal manufacturing interests over the last 200 years. And I think perhaps I can say no better than the words that Neil Cousins, who was the previous director of the Science Museum and chairman of English Heritage, who said of this collection, that the Hawley collection is an outstanding asset of national and international significance. I know of no other comparable collection related to the history, technology and evolution of tools and cutlery in their manufacture. It is in the tactile nature of much of the Hawley collection that its secrets lie. Tools are there to be used, their qualities appreciated by how effectively they fit the purpose for which they are designed and made. And there's craftsmanship in their making and craftsmen using them. And the highly personal nature of the relationship between the one and the other was what part of what made Sheffield so special. And it was Ken's life work that he in a sense dedicated to try and ensuring that that was recorded and in a sense maintained and also that energy and knowledge that he had in terms of making the collection known we tried to ensure is passed on in the work that we do. Our current work uh, plan is obviously at the moment disturbed by Covid. Um, since last March, it's almost a year now, uh, we've perhaps only physically been able to be in the building about three months. And on current time scales, um, the museum is not due to be open to the public at least until about May the 17th. Um, not quite sure why you can go and buy things and have your hair cut um, in April, but you can't go to a museum until uh, mid-May. Uh, but what we have been able to do, we've been able still to try and remotely respond to the steady stream of enquiries we still get, get, not just national ones, but worldwide. And some of that has been driven by the work that we've been doing on the Knife database. And equally, we've been able to enhance the Knife database, which has gone on at pace and have made it web accessible during that time. And we've also um, expanded our digital resources, have expanded onto YouTube and the website. And I showed earlier on, that we'd actually um, got in a sense the, uh, that particular part um, is on the database. But our YouTube listings, um, we now have something like 40 films that we've loaded over the last uh, few months um, to be available publicly on YouTube. So if you put Ken Hawley collection um, within any YouTube search, it should bring up our channel. And Basically, this illustrates the range of films that Ken was involved in putting together uh, between the early 1960s and about the mid-1990s. Um, it's interesting when you actually analyse um, the usage of it. Since last September, and it was only really from last September that the bulk of our content was uploaded, we've had over 60,000 views. And our subscriber base, people who obviously want to be kept in touch, doubled during that time to over 2,000 people. Interesting enough, 32% of those subscribers are from the US um, and slightly more than people in a sense who subscribe uh, with a UK address, although um, some people looking through a VPN uh, probably are hiding their location. The interesting bit in the last top in the last 14 days um, of UC, when I checked yesterday, it perhaps comes as no surprise given Stan's uh, 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 death a couple of weeks ago is that the penknife cutler film of, of Stan Shaw um, is currently the most popular film still followed interestingly enough uh, by the film Ken made on making files by hand which illustrates and also in a sense uh, talks through the process uh, but is still by far and away a continuing popular film third and perhaps most surprising to me is a film on organ making uh, which Footprint Tools um, was made with Ken's assistance in 1993. And then finally, a more recent one is a film of Norman Bayliss, um, hand-making um, wooden moulding planes um, at Marples in the early 1960s. Um, 
but all of them have had very positive comments and have given access to a lot of people who obviously, um, not just within the UK, uh, but also worldwide. In the future, we obviously need to adapt as we continue to do uh, some four or five years after is life after Ken. So the support for the collection is sustainable. And I've already in a sense illustrated so that we can actually ensure that support and involvement sustains his passion and knowledge of the collection. We clearly in a sense need to average income streams to sustain the trust costs. Um, but we also in a sense continue support what will be the new Sheffield Museums Trust uh, to sustain Kellum and thereby our running costs um, after, after April this year. We cle clearly have also got the challenge of a, a more inclusive front of house officer and that we need to sustain our active exhibition programme and interacting with the visiting public. We have aspired to national designation of the collection and in a sense almost, in, I think, encouraged by the comment that Neil Cousins um, added. Unfortunately, our first attempt uh, was rejected, but it won't stop us um, trying to seek um, a designation for our collection. We have expanded, as I've said, our worldwide uh, presence through the web, uh, publishing our knowledge in ways and new ways apart from print. And finally, perhaps is my uh, in the last comment in terms of the longer term, is exploring the options for Hawley 3 to sh showcase tool making and tools in a working way um, so that in a sense those words that Neil Cousins had that tools are only in a sense there uh, to be used and to bring them to life. I well remember Ken died on a Friday, I last saw him on a Wednesday morning down at the Hoyle Collection and I was departing and his final words to me which I remember him shouting down the says and don't forget all the three uh, because we've been talking about in a sense how uh, the, 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 the the, the uh, collection was to de develop and so in a sense to, to keep the collection alive is one of our key aims. We have in terms of development just a brief illustration we've raised something over 1.1 million pounds in terms of the developments we've had had to date um, and the running costs which are part of our essential bit we started life being supported by the university since moving to Kellum, uh, the Industrial Museums Trust have supported, which I've referred to. We hope that will continue after April with the new um, Museums Trust. We are quite cheap because we only have volunteers. Um, and but the cost of operating the stuff outside of what we get support in kind from the Museums Trust is only about £2,000. And donations um, are all, always welcome. And just finally to finish off with, uh, the collection isn't just about the tools themselves, it does inspire other thoughts and one of our uh, clear supporters um, in the past was Roy Ridsdale, again uh, recently departed in the last couple of years. It inspired, uh, whilst they might look like photographs, are actually drawings that um, inspired uh, Roy uh, to produce a portfolio of artwork which he sold for not inconsiderable prices in an exhibition held in the Millennium Garries. So hopefully in a sense in the hour, I've noticed my clock is just coming spot on seven o'clock. I've been able to do a quick canter through our collection. Um, please, when we open after May the 17th, if you haven't been to Sears, come to Sears. Um, and if you've got any sense skills to offer, we'd be only more uh, uh, welcome to see you. Thanks very much for listening. And I'll back, hand it back to Andrew. Thank you very much, Keith. Uh, excellent uh, presentation tonight. Now we have got the opportunity and um, maybe 10 minutes or so for people to ask questions. If you want to ask a question, I'd ask you to please use the Q&A function in Zoom, put your question in there, and uh, we will present those questions to Keith. So far we've just got one question, which is a bit of an obscure one, but uh, on we go, Keith. A uh, question from Peter. Do you, Does the recently introduced data protection regulations present any problems with respect to the storage and dissemination of important information relevant to the provenance of the items in the collection? Um, a good question, Peter, and a highly technical one in terms of data protection. Not that I'm aware of, because most of the information we've got, as far as the trusts are concerned, much of the collection in provenance terms uh, is dealt with by the fact that we acquired it from Ken. Um, and therefore, in a sense, the problem is we've had, a, in a sense, a legal owner who passed the, the uh, collection on to us. Ken did note down where, obviously, where he acquired uh, some of them. Some of it is illustrated by trade names. Uh, but in terms of data protection, uh, we haven't 
got much data in relation to individuals um, that, that came, came with it. Okay, so if anyone else has got any further questions, please, uh, please put them into the uh, Q&A function now. Um, while we don't have any more questions at the moment, Keith, I will ask uh, Mark, our secretary, to give a vote of thanks. And then if any more questions come in, we can uh, drop back in there uh, and take those. That's okay with you? Yep. So I'd like ask Mark, ask Mark Tomlinson, our secretary, to give Tonight's vote of thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, thank you very much, Keith. That was uh, a fascinating insight into the, the history of the Holy Collection uh, and, and of the, the tools themselves. Uh, I think it's, uh, I know I always uh, enjoy walking around a new a new factory, seeing a new way to do things. And uh, and the, the part of the interest of that is is to get inside the the head of the people who have uh, who have established these process routes and these and these tools, um, and you, you often come across something and think someone with an amazing mind must have must must have come up with this tool to do that specific job, uh, and it's nice to see that 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 ingenuity and that that skill and craft uh, is is valued and is being kept alive by collections like like the Holy Collection. So I'd, I'd like to thank you for sharing with us your, your stories of the, the, the craft and the technology and how that led through to the work that was done and the lives that, that people lived. Uh, I thought it was great to hear about your future plans uh, and certainly we'll all keep our eyes open for, uh, for Holy Three. Um, and I'll certainly from uh, men of, uh, of an age such as myself and some of our other Members, it's always good to see that uh, old old tools can remain tools as long as they're being used. So that's uh, that is something that uh, we can all hang on to, I think. So, so I perhaps throw out a challenge, Andrew, to in a sense current members. Also, the Holy Collection might look as though it's retrospective, looking backwards. There is the challenge we always face of how actually we record what is being done now in the processes we've got and how we actually you do record those. Particularly, I mean, even interest on trade catalogues, the fact people don't produce them in paper form now actually presents a challenge in how actually you keep copies uh, for future generations to actually look at. Um, and so it's a new challenge in terms of, and equally for some of the processes and some of the tools that provide is, is how in a sense we, 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 we collect them. Um, so uh, th that's a challenge which we face, but equally, I think for people working in industry at the moment, it's something just to really sense, log in your mind um, about how, in a sense, we, we, we make those uh, records available in the future. Right, well, a couple of other questions come in, Keith, if you would mind taking them. Yeah. Um, first question is, are you still keen on acquiring hand tools, um, etc., made in, made, I assume it says here, I assume in Sheffield. Uh, yes, um, although all museums will always say is, yes, we are, but we equally have to be sometimes quite forceful and actually turn people down when we've actually got copies of items in, in, uh, in, stock, in stock already. But we're more than happy, in a sense, to look at them and evaluate them for people uh, to see whether, in fact, they can add to the collection. And assuming people have got something that they might be interested in donating or having in the collection, they could contact you via the email at your website. Yep. Okay. Uh, another question from, uh, are there any similar collections abroad? There are similar collections abroad. In fact, I, um, not probably of the scale and interest enough, we've had, certainly during my time, uh, three or four parties, not least one who came last year uh, bearing a cheque for £7,000, which was always welcome, um, from a group of American tool collectors where they're particularly active, who clearly, in, in a sense, uh, there, there is a, let's say, a, a, a well-embedded uh, lot of tool collectors in the States. But I don't think there's anything of the breadth and depth that we, we have um, here uh, within Sheffield. And it's not just, dare I say, people I know, uh, that what I know we've got within the Orley Collection. I'm aware that there are private collectors of tools um, in Sheffield as well as uh, nationwide. So in a sense, the depth particularly of the Holy Collection is probably unique. Um, and I think Ledney will cause it to say it's probably the world's best collection of hand tools. Right, well, I appear to have run, thank you very much, Keith. We appear to run out of questions. 
Um, obviously, we thank everyone for attending tonight's lecture. Hope you everyone has enjoyed it. And we will obviously seek to uh, source out such an excellent speaker for next year again on another aspect of industrial history, hopefully in the Sheffield region.